probably have to write research grants and proposals. And it always amazes me because you're supposed to be talking about what you're going to be doing four years down the road. And if science is any good, you don't know what you're going to be doing four years down the road. Let me play devil's advocate for a minute and take that point beyond where it was going. The second point that came out of that was um, I've spoken to a number of scientists who would actually say if they had to write a headline, science is broken. And what they meant by that is that there's too many people trying to get too many papers into too few journals. The refereeing process is very difficult. It's not people sitting at the Athenaeum passing the thing around. And, it's, and somehow it, there needs to be a different kind of refereeing system for, each pe for people to judge their work, that maybe there shouldn't be anonymous referees, maybe people should have to sign their referee. Do you have a sense of any of this? Because that's, that's, a, that's another part of the community how the community is arranged. No, I think, I think, I think it's a, 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 a cogent point in that we scientists probably have not applied scientific self-scrutiny to our own cultural norms as much as we should. It's been taken for granted that peer review is the only ritual that can sanctify a finding, <laughs> even though we know from studies of peer review that it has a number of systematic flaws. <laughs> the name, uh, the reputation of the person writing the paper makes too big a difference, which you can always guess even when it's blacked out. Too much depends arbitrarily on the choice of referees. If you just pick two people, uh, that is such a small sample that uh, the outcome is going to be determined by whether you have someone that's sympathetic or not to the basic approach. And there are alternatives. I think we've inherited a practice that comes from the era in which paper was a limiting resource, that mailing out copies of a journal was so expensive that only a small number of organizations could do it. Now that we do have the, the internet and the, uh, as a form of disseminating information and space is basically limitless, limitless we should look to other models well, of quality control. Not, and like PLOS, the Public Library mm -hmm. of Science, which has some different techniques such as people can post comments on published papers and so if a bad paper gets published it will live in with the ignominy of all of the critical remarks yeah I'm Are, not you know I, I I've been in that position recently as uh, in, in, in a, one of the positions I have in the American Physical Society which publishes unpeer-reviewed journal which and there was a uh, uh, global warming uh, uh, skeptics paper that got into it, and 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 then it was interpreted immediately as a scientific finding. I, I tend to think I'm not sure. There is an editor friend of mine who would like to publish every paper he gets along with the referees report beside it, but and that's one possibility. It would make better referees reports. I think that's for sure. But but I think it's peer review is like democracy. You know, it's sort of it's not. It's got a lot of problems, but I, right now I think it it, it works and on average and. And I don't know if there's a better system because the problem with the internet is there's no filter. At some level, if you want to, if, if, if you, there's so much information out there and so little time to read, we already get too many papers that we can read. There, we have to, I think, as a community, have some filter that, that allows us to select out. Let me, well, let me make a radical uh, suggestion that maybe we should evaluate the different methods empirically. Uh, oh, as scientists, yeah. see well, which that's one. A, that's not we, a bad idea. But, but along those lines, uh, Lawrence, <laughs> do you actually read peer reviewed? Articles? No, that, you, 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 Brian's exactly right. In our field, by the time it gets peer reviewed, it's old news. Yeah, I mean, so we basically, everything goes on our online archive, and okay. we just choose what we want to read. And, and we decide what's garbage on our own as opposed to reading it in the journal and saying it's garbage. More or less. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a difficulty with that, though, and that, that is that, you know, so some people are competent to. Uh, differentiate between stuff that's rubbish and stuff that isn't. And then there are a lot of people out there who aren't really competent yeah, to make that. And, and th this is why, um, providing one's careful about this, that there is some utility in a bottleneck system, uh, which serves to some extent at any rate as an expert filter for what comes through. I mean, you, you, you could have a situation where let anybody publish what they like on the internet. In fact, they can already. If you've, you've written a paper and you want to publish it on your blog site or something, yeah, you can exactly. go ahead and do it. So uh, th th there's no reason why absolutely anything that gets written shouldn't be out there. But what you do want is to have some sort of uh, uh, imprimatur. You want, you want some sort of recognition that peers, that colleagues are prepared to take this seriously and, and discuss it and so on. And after all, peer review and publication in the, in the traditional way is anyway only one step in the life of, a, of a, an idea or a paper. And there are going to be lots of other things that are tested too. When people try and you know, replicate those results or something, they may well find out that, in fact, uh, the, the stuff doesn't work and, and that's going to be a check on it. So, so I, I think there is something to be said for um, obliging things if they were going to have a, a little bit of a stamp of, of acceptability on it from the profession, that there should be a, a bit of a bottleneck, providing that it doesn't result in a lot of good stuff and very innovative stuff 
just being excluded, as could well happen with something which is really genuinely original. Well, it's more archival in a sense. We, you know, we don't, there's not every piece of paper in this room that we're going to record, keep for posterity. Mm -hmm. And we tend, I think, uh, peer review and journals in some sense have now become archi archival. It's more a record of those things which seem to represent progress in the field as opposed to the things which really drive progress for right now, which are the, uh, probably before, at least in physics, before yeah, peer but, review. But there's, there's an interesting point here which, which um, one of the writers for Science, the magazine, John Cohen made at a, at a meeting the other day, which was he was saying that the way most undergraduates, and maybe graduates as well, and postdocs, get their information is to go online to PubMed, and put in their institution's um, yeah. subscription, download the PDF of the specific paper, and they're done. Well, half of the book of a journal like Nature or Science, the front half of the book is not papers, it's context. It's what is the science community doing and what's the world doing about science. It's got all the, the news stories in there, the context, the commentary and so on. And very few of them actually physically touch these things anymore. Now, is that a loss? I mean, are, context is... Well, yes. if, if it's correct context, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think, although, you know, I don't, I'm not sure I agree because at least I, most of us probably get a lot of our stuff electronically now anyway. And, and uh, as far as science and nature is concerned, I tend to get their weekly news. I mean, I get on my, in, on my email mm. the, the, all the context and commentary that would have come in the front half You'd of that You'd be surprised if, even, if you, even if you talk about an ordinary newspaper, how many people you'll go to when they're reading the online version will suddenly, because they're staying at a hotel or something, get a newspaper and they'll say, I, had, I found such really interesting stories here that I'd never <laughs> have seen before because it was online. Yeah, there, there, there is a, there's an amazing a, service that will actually download <laughs> and print stories on hard copy and deliver it to you in your mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> it's called magazine. No, it's revolutionary. <laughs> no, but you know what? It, it's, we're all of a pretty well a similar generation, I think. Um, and I'm wondering, I, I, it's an, it'll be an interesting empirical study. I'm wondering if my daughter's generation or her children's generation, when there's one, will in fact find it much more comfortable to read things online. For example, I bet all of us made this transition. When I first started to write scientific papers, at the beginning, it was very difficult for me to do things on computers. Mm -hmm. But now, I can't handwrite uh, anything. And, and that transition has been made. And it could just be that we're, we're just dinosaurs ourselves, and we're relics of this paper uh, generation. And it's not easy for us to get information that way, and that the next generation will find it much more comfortable to do that. I don't I, know. I, I think Anthony's objection to the um, putting it on your blog and, uh, I mean, the, the need for a filter mm. is met if other people recommend it. I mean, I, mean, I often get, get emails from them and say, you must read this yeah, paper, it's yeah. terrific. Mm. And, and if it, that's from somebody I respect, then, mm. then I'll go and read it. And, and so you could sort of have a network of, of um, not, not, not formal refereeing, but of informal recommendation and, and anybody can read so, I mean if you know Lawrence has a blog and I can re read right. that he recommends this paper um, I it. would do it well I we have an imperfect you. we have an imperfect <laughs> system in physics where not everybody can post to the, the physics archive I forget what the requirements, requirements are but you have to reach a certain threshold before you're allowed to freely post articles now that's not always a good thing there there I have I've gotten many phone calls from people will you please be my sponsor so I can post this paper and it maybe is a, I don't have time to read I get too yeah, you know yeah. but it's a, it, you know on the one hand you don't want to cut out the people because they don't reach the threshold on the other hand it does do what you're saying it's not quite refereeing but the but people have a certain mm. level of experience and already a track record mm. the other thing sorry go yeah, ahead, go. sure go ahead. The, the the other thing is that it, uh, publishing on paper has become so easy now yeah. uh, that, that, that you know I, I get Vanity Press books it's hard, yeah. essentially every day. Yeah, um, all of us. And, and I sort of look and see who I don't recognise that publisher's name, <laughs> yeah. and, and then you, re you realise that it's from the same small town as the author. And, and, but but I, you know, I also want to exactly. But I want to jump in. I think I don't know what it's like in biology, and 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 but I think we already operate under your principle. I bet Brian and I do not r look at every paper that's on the archive every day, or even the abstracts of every paper. We tend to end up looking at those that are, com the, the good papers tend to, word of mouth tends to filter in our students.